Okay. Can you see everything? Just the nice screen? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm really excited to share this topic with you. Um, we're going to talk about hardware and CircuitPython. Um, once I figure out how to actually go to the next slide. All right, there we go. Um, hi, I'm Kira Hartledge. I am a software engineer at GE Appliances located in Louisville, Kentucky. My background's actually in mechanical engineering. That's what I studied in school. And um, I worked for about eight years um, in ref our refrigeration department, um, working on ice and water system design um, that varied between like ice maker, um, ice dispense systems for refrigerators, um, like designing plastic park, parts, specking out loaders, uh, valves, et cetera. Um, as a hobby, I started learning how to code on my own um, back when edX and Coursera first came out and everything was free. I got real excited about that. Um, started taking classes on my own. Um, and so over the years, I just got more and more interested in software um, and transitioned to a software role at my current company, HE Appliances. Um, so instead of kind of specking out the physical parts, now I'm writing the hardware, or the firmware for the microcontrollers that control the appliances. Um, and I've been doing that for almost two years now. That is the inspiration for this talk. Um, I wanted to teach you all a little bit about what is embedded software, um, a little bit about hardware, and then how you can use CircuitPython to create your own projects. Um, so first we'll talk a little bit about like what actually is an embedded system. Um, so an embedded system is a computerized system that's purpose built for an application. So this is different than, um, like your computer, um, it uh, does one thing. Um, your computer or microprocessor is able to do multiple things. Um, it's different than like an operating system where you could like install a new program um, and it now does something different. Um, the embedded system is designed for just one thing. Um, it's not gonna do anything different unless you basically wipe out what the code is there and start over. Um, this quote's from Alicia White. Um, she wrote a book called Making Embedded Systems um, that kind of walks through similar topics that I'll go over today, like on just what is embedded, what's hardware, um, how it works, um, like how to write software for it. And there's also um, a website and podcast that she has called embedded.fm. And the podcast is really cool because she just talks to all these different people in industry who either like write code for hardware or they just have really cool jobs and side projects. Um, so you can get kind of just a taste of what, what's out there. Um, so central to the embedded system is the microcontroller, the, the brain of the operations. Um, it's really just a circuit. It has a processor, memory, and it's able to interact with other things. And we call those um, the input output peripherals that allow you to do that. Um, and you can kind of, it's usually just like the pins on the microcontroller is what you connect to to do other things. Um, so that microcontroller is this like um, black square in this picture. And you can see the little silver looking like pins coming off of that block. Um, and that's what's connected to all these other circuits on this, this blue board here. Um, that's how you kind of connect to it, and interact with it. But um, there are certain things that microcontroller is able, able to do. Um, so there's like the instructions that's like your what you're able to work with. Um, the microcontroller has registers, um, and those are store, fast storage locations and memory that um, the microcontroller has access to, and it allows it to do things very quickly. Um, and those registers are going to be specific to like what type of microcontroller it is, um, and it's going to be different from microcontroller to microcontroller. Um, and then they usually have some sort of memory, um, so you can store the code and some data. Um, it's very limited in memory. A lot of times we'll have to have external memory to store anything that you need might need long term. And it's usually also much slower to access that memory. So to do like quick operations, um, usually just you handle with the registers. Um, forgot to mention, I think. So this is a little bit different than like a microprocessor. Um, like this, it's, it just does one thing. Microprocessor can do multiple things um, as well. Um, so the peripherals that I mentioned before are ways to interact with the outside world. Um, so this is a schematic on the right 
of a microcontroller chip. And it's actually the one that's on this board that I will be showing examples with. Um, let me unplug it. I don't know if you can see that, but this black square is the microcontroller. And so that is the yellow square on the slide. Um, and it's super tiny, but it has labels for each pin. And then it comes out and shows some of the circuits that are on the um, that are on there. So those are the ways you can kind of connect things together into those pins. Um, and then that's specific to microcontroller, and you'd have to look up like the hardware manual for it to in order to know what all those pins do, because um, uh, just looking at it, it's not going to tell you. <laughs> um, it's pretty cryptic looking. Um, but we'll get a little more into the details on that in a sec. But there are different types of peripherals. Um, some you may have heard of before. Um, the kind of the basic one is the GPIO, and that stands for General Purpose Input Output. So that's if you want to control something basically on or off, open, close. You get binary. You get two options. Um, and this would be something if you connected to like an LED, you could turn it on and off. Um, if you connected it to um, say like a hall sensor and you pass a magnet over a hall sensor, it give, could give you feedback of like, I saw the magnet, I didn't see the magnet. Um, so you get like a true false reading back. And really what it's doing is um, if you're setting an output to high, you're actually setting it to like a high voltage. Um, and then if it's low, you're connecting it to ground and it's sending out no, no voltage um, to what you're connected to. And um, I have to say, I'm not really an electrical engineer, so I don't I kind of assume everything after the microcontroller works great. That's how we kind of did separate it um, in the industry, like at least in my company. We write the firmware, we set the, like what the pin should do. Electrical engineers worry about the circuits that are connected to it. Um, but there's like a whole nother world of uh, like how to actually design the circuit to connect to this. So we're just focusing on like, what's the software going to do? Um, another one is analog to digital control known as ADC. So a lot of um, signals out in the world are analog, like temperature. Um, in order for the microcontroller to interpret that and understand what that is, it has to convert it to a digital signal. Um, and this would be the case if you want to read like the room temperature with the thermistor, the microcontroller will have to convert that. Um, so you know like it's 70 Fahrenheit. Um, the opposite of that is taking a digital signal and converting it to an analog signal. Um, some examples of this are like audio or video files. Um, and then um, one of my favorites is called PWM or pulse width modulation. Um, this is where instead of turning something on or off, you actually turn it on and off very quickly. Um, but it's very much at the lower hardware level that it's actually flipping it between the on and off very quickly. Um, and we do this to control like a variable speed motor or a fan or a compressor um, by varying like how long it's on, how long it's off. You can change like the duty cycle and the frequency of that signal in order to achieve like a different speed. Um, and then some of the more complicated ones I've listed at the bottom. We have hardware timers if you want to keep track of different events um, that happen or time. And then um, serial communication, there are multiple different communication protocols for microcontrollers to talk to another microcontroller. Um, and then there's interrupts if you wanna um, to know when an event happens. So like on your computer, if you press like a key on the keyboard, um, that sends an interrupt. And so then your computer knows like, hey, I need to do something when somebody presses this key, like I need to display it on the screen. Um, so I will show a few examples of some of these in the uh, next few slides after uh, with using CircuitPython. So I chose CircuitPython um, because I knew some Python and um, this is pretty much set up for beginners and people who wanna learn um, like how to write code for hardware, how to build like IoT projects. People who are just like looking for a, a new hobby. Um, it's basically designed for you. Um, so it's from Adafruit. They're the ones who created CircuitPython. And if you haven't heard of Adafruit, I want to explain a little about the company. So they're a minority and a woman-owned business enterprise. And they were founded by um, 
uh, this woman here with the pink hair and uh, her, she goes by Lady Ada, which I think is really cool. Um, but she created this company basically with a goal of teaching people how to like create these electronics projects. And they, she wants it to be open to all ages and all skill levels. Um, and the website is just awesome. Like obviously they're selling you stuff, but at the same time, there's like the whole other side of the website. Um, it's just learning and other people will post like projects of what things they've made. And there's tons and tons of tutorials um, of how to build all these like really just amazing things. Um, and they also have like just crazy LED strips and things. You can like with tons of different cool colors. And I just, I just love how colorful it is too. Um, so with that, uh, if you haven't heard of CircuitPython, um, you might not also have heard of MicroPython and that's where it originally started. Um, I don't know much about MicroPython, but um, it's basically a full Python compiler and runtime environment that runs on bare metal, which means there's no operating system. It, um, we call it running bare metal, like it literally like it's running on the metal of the microcontroller. Um, and so that's kind of like the lowest level. And then CircuitPython was adapted from that um, and created to get users up and running as quickly as possible with like as little, um, kind of like overhead that you'd have to put into it. Um, they take care of a lot of the setup for you. Uh, and with that, I want to give you just kind of some background on like what it means to write code for hardware. Um, it's challenging. Um, so there's limited memory on that microcontroller. Um, so you need like a low level language that's small in size, efficient. Uh, most people write in C. Um, in the industry at, or assembly. Um, at GE Appliances, we write in C. Um, and that also presents its own challenges if you don't know C and you want to get into learning it and um, might not be as easy as you know starting with Python. Um, you don't have an operating system, so you can't just build off of something that's already there. Um, it requires a lot of startup code to even get the microcontroller like doing anything. Like to get it to blink an LED, it's going to take a lot and a lot of setup. And to figure out how to set it up, it's even more complicated because there are really large manuals for microcontrollers. It's specific to each microcontroller. Um, you have to look up like what register to set. It doesn't really tell you step by step what to do. And it's just not user friendly. It's not something you'd want to do on your own. Um, luckily, you know, kind of industry, you would hope that like the company is supportive. Um, and we, we build like a ton of startup code that we build like reusable modules and things to kind of prevent that barrier as a job, but as a hobby, um, it's, it's, you don't want to be doing that. Um, it requires, you know, compilers, linkers, you need special equipment uh, that might be proprietary just to flash your microcontroller after you even got it. Um, so it's not fun, but it can be fun <laughs> because of CircuitPython. Um, so they specifically designed it for beginners. Um, you don't really need to be familiar with Python because um, they have a ton of libraries and the way they're designed, it's just, you, it's kind of just flows. Like the naming of the, the functions and the variables and stuff, it's kind of specific to the board and the hardware and you kind of just could be like red LED on type of thing. Um, it just makes it real easy to learn. Um, even better, you can get microcontrollers from Adafruit. They already have CircuitPython on them, so you don't have to do any setup. Um, some even come with code already on there. You can just plug it in. Um, that's another good thing. You can plug it in with a USB, um, and that's it. You're good to go. That's all you need is the USB cable. So just plug it in, plug in my USB, I'm good. Um, so you don't need any special equipment. You can use whatever text editor you want. Um, and you basically just save the file and it'll upload the code for you. Um, and then it's just saved on the board and you can take it with you and plug it into another computer, edit again. Um, it's really, really handy. So the one that I have here is a circuit playground blue fruit. It's blue. It's called blue fruit because it has Bluetooth. There's also a circuit playground express um, available that does not have Bluetooth, but I think they're like, they cost exactly the same. So I would just get the blue Bluetooth one. Um, 
but it has um, the microcontroller. Uh, or my mouse went, I will. Okay, it's got the microcontroller and then it has a bunch of different sensors on there. It also has um, looks like 10 LEDs, RGB LEDs around the center. Um, it's got like a motion sensor, temperature sensor, light sensor, sound sensor, speaker, button, slide switch, and it's all in this little tiny package. So you kind of get a bunch of different things to play with and you don't have to you know, attach anything else to it um, to get started. And it also has um, like holes and they also sell like uh, conductive thread, which I thought was pretty cool. So you could like sew the boards onto your clothes or, you know, onto some other fabric or like some other project you're working on um, to get super, super creative with that. Um, but yeah, like I really like it because it's just easy, it's easy to get going and play with. So you'll get, if you got buy a board, you plug it in, um, you open the file, it'll usually come up with like um, some sample code in like a code.py file um, that might blink an LED and that's it. But all you have to do is edit that file and you can make it do something else and save it, you're good to go. Um, you can also um, create a lib folder, a library folder, and then they have libraries on Adafruit's website and you can just drag and drop them on there as you need them um, to get to use those libraries and get more functionality out of it. Um, and so the one, the one thing is like, it's still a microcontroller that doesn't have, you know, infinite memory. So you don't want to like bring in all the libraries at once. You just want to like kind of use them as, add them as you go. Um, but yeah, it's as simple as it is to get started. Um, and I'll start showing a few examples. I did include code on here. It might look, I don't know. I always feel weird about putting code in slides, but I want to include that to show just kind of show how easy it is and show that you can actually fit it on like a slide. Um, but um, so the hello world example of hardware is the blink in LED and we call it like a heartbeat LED. Um, so this two blocks of code here are doing the exact same thing on the board using different libraries um, that are available for CircuitPython. So the one on the left um, includes a little bit more setup. So you have to, um, pick a pin um, on the board and then just say, I want it to be an output. And that's where it's picking that board.led corresponds to this little LED here. And you would know that only by looking at the documentation, but it's the LED, so it must be an important one. Um, and then you set it to an output saying like, I want it to, I want to control it and make it do something. And then we have um, our while true loop which is kind of our main execution loop. And this is what's gonna run forever when you have the board, you know, kind of operating by itself. Um, so it's gonna turn the LED on by setting the value to true. It's gonna sleep for a second and then turn it off by turning it or setting it false. And then wait another second and then keep going forever. Um, so that'll create a blinking LED. The one on the right, there's actually a circuit playground library specific for these circuit playground boards. Um, which makes the code a lot shorter. Um, and in this case, that LED is the red LED. And you don't even have to set it up and say it's an output. You can just say true and false. And they have all that functionality inside of that library. Um, and they have a read the doc site that goes into all the different, like um, the library and all the different options you have there. And then I pre-recorded some videos and hopefully it works. So I was afraid to do it live. Let's see if I can go to the next slide and get it to play. Nope, 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 go back. There we go. So this isn't super, super exciting, but you can see the light <laughs> blink. So um, usually with our, our projects, we'll set up an LED and we'll have it blink forever. And that's how we know if a board is working or not. Um, Sorry, get this back up. Go away. Okay. But yeah, like you'll just blink an LED forever. And then if we have a problem with the board, um, you can see that it's not blinking. It must, there must be something wrong. Um, another really cool thing about um, CircuitPython, um, you can use the serial console 
um, to see the output from like print statements. So you can add print statements to your code um, to help you debug. And um, yeah, so I'm on Linux and I used um, this program called Screen in order to show the serial console. And there's um, instructions, yeah, on the link below that um, if you need to do it for a different um, operating system. But once you connect to the USB port where it's connected, um, you can see the output. So here, the same example, same example of blinking the LED, but in this case, it would print light on, light off, light on, light off. And you can see in real time when it's on, it prints that statement and when it's off, it prints the next statement to help debug um, what's going on if you're having a problem. An even cooler part of that is you can also enter a REPL um, and run the code. Like you're on your computer looking at the REPL, you type it in there and it'll run on the board as long as you know, you're still connected. Um, so in this case, I can import the libraries, I can set up the LED and set it to true and it'll be on the board. I just think that's like super cool. <laughs> you do it in real time, like I want to turn it off and then it'll turn off in your hand. Um, so that's an, another, another fun way to interact with it besides writing the code up front and saving it on there. So um, after uh, you know blinking LED, you might want to do something else. So there's two buttons on here and a little tiny switch. And to get the input from there, you're going to want to read what it is. Um, in this case, if you press a um, button. When it's pressed down, it'll read true. And when it's up, you'll it'll be false. And in this case, like when you press a button, you're like closing a circuit or like um, basically like float, not really floating, but like you're disconnecting two contacts. Um, and that's how we're able to determine like if voltage or sorry, current is flowing. If we read a voltage. You can see if it's true or false um, in the code. And then for the switch, yeah, one direction is true, one direction is false. Um, when we read that input. And then um, yeah, all this information I, you know, you can get from Adafruit's website and the CircuitPython docs. So in this example, I have um, set up a couple of different colors and variables that I wanted before I use them to make it easier. Um, and then I set the brightness of these NeoPixels to 0 0.01 because they are super bright. <laughs> um, but uh, so if the switch is true, then um, I'm going to be reading, uh, sorry, I'll be filling these pixels with the color green. If the switch is false, then I'm going to check these conditions. So if the button is button A is pressed, I'll make them pink. If button B is pressed, I'll make them yellow. And if neither are pressed, um, they'll be red. And then it just keeps going through this loop over and over and over again and checking. And that's how it can um, kind of detect it as you change it, because um, it just goes through this super quick um, on the order of like milliseconds. Um, so here I'm just pressing the buttons and nothing's happening because the switch isn't in isn't um, false position. And then once I switch it over, then I'm able to change change the color of the lights. Um, but yeah, like once you're able to, you know, get some input, you can you can start seeing you can do more and more different things. Oh, it's playing again. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so yeah, so there was also a temperature sensor on the board itself. Um, and I mentioned before that temperature is an analog signal, and that means it's you know it's not uh, discrete. That's the word. It's continuous, um, and so we have to convert it to a digital signal. And this is all taken care of for you by the Circuit Playground um, and Circuit Python. So you don't actually have to do any of that setup or figure out how it gets converted. Um, it's kind of just given to you. You get to read the temperature out. Um, and um, a little bit about how you actually read temperature. This is a thermistor. Um, 
And the thermistor basically changes resistance with respect or with, um, yeah, with respect to temperature. So the higher, higher the temperature, the lower the resistance. Um, and then if the resistance is changing, um, the voltage is changing. And so when you read a different voltage, you'll get a different temperature. Um, and in this case, with that circuit playground library, um, it's literally just temperature. There's only one sensor on it. So it's referred to just temperature. And so I can read the temperature from the sensor into this variable. Um, and then for each of the pixels on the board, I have 10 pixels, I'm going to determine what color I want to set it to. Um, and then, yeah, wait. Wait a uh, half a second. So in this little bit in the range, so I tried to, um, I wanted it to do like if it was if it was warmer, it would light up more LEDs, and if it was colder, it would light up less LEDs. So that's what it's doing here. Um, it's determining like how many LEDs to actually light up, um, depending on what the temperature is. So the warmer the temperature, the more pixels are actually going to be filled with a, with a uh, color, and the color will be from this uh, array. So that looks like at the time when I did it, it doesn't actually change because I, I thought I could just touch the temperature sensor and have it increase a lot, but I think my finger was about the same temperature as the room. Uh, but in this case, the temperature was about room temperature and it um, lit up seven LEDs. So if it was warmer, I put it outside, it would you know light up more LEDs. It's kind of like a temperature gauge there. Um, another ADC um, sensor is the accelerometer. Um, this example I got from, um, there's a LinkedIn learning course um, that teaches CircuitPython with the Circuit Playground Express that I took. Um, so if you have LinkedIn learning um, access at all, you check it out. Um, it goes through similar examples as my presentation and it kind of breaks it down for you um, really easily. I really liked it. Um, so this one was called Tippy Lights. And you'll see in a second why it's called tippy lights. But um, so there's an accelerometer on here and they actually label the axes for you on the board. So you know which direction is which. Um, so you know, like it's, yeah, positive Y in this picture, X is the other direction and Z is going out towards you, I think. Um, so in this case, we're gonna change the speed at which these LEDs light up depending on the acceleration in the y direction. Um, let me make sure I say this correctly. So if the, um, yes, yeah, I'll back up. So this library also has a really simple way to access the accelerometer too. It's just called acceleration.y if you want the one in x, dot x, dot z. Um, and in this case, take an absolute value where the acceleration is minus 10. Um, I believe it's in meters per second squared and gravity is 9.8, so it was close. Um, this formula is pretty much just arbitrary. It was just to get a cool animation. But um, so the higher the acceleration in the y, um, or the closer to 10, the smaller amount here times another small 0 0.03, you'll get a really small delay time. So when it goes through this while loop, it'll do it very quickly. It'll go through. It'll light up the LEDs pink um, and then repeat back up to the wall true loop. But if the acceleration is very small in the Y direction, this will um, evaluate to a larger delay time. So it'll take longer to go back through the wall loop. Um, and when you tip the board, this creates a cool effect. Uh, here's the board just sitting on a desk. And then if you lift it up, the lights slow down because that delay time increases because the acceleration in the Y is smaller. I think I might have said that right. Um, but yeah, like just um, you could change it to do a different axis or maybe incorporate both of them. So you could just kind of twirl it around and you can get different uh, cool lighting effects there.
shouldn't skip anything. Okay. Another really cool thing is um, these goldish looking like things with the holes in them. <laughs> so those are actually capacitive touch pads get with your finger <laughs> and um, you're able to read that from the micro to know that someone's touched it. Um, so in the library, there is a, a so this touch threshold that kind of sets how sensitive they are. Uh, um, um, and they all have um, labels. So this is like A1, A2, A3. It's just kind of like the name of them, but it's touch underscore that name. So if it like A1 is touched, then it's going to play this tone. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the play tone is also another library um, function. <clears throat> and these scales here are different frequencies. So you give the play tone a frequency and then a duration, and I think this is seconds. So it'll do it for a quarter of a second. Um, and if you touch a different pad, it'll play a different um, frequency. And then the whole loop, it's just checking if any of them are pressed, delaying for 0 0.05 seconds and then going all the way through again. So in this way, you can touch different pads and it'll just keep playing, keep playing tones. Um, assuming hopefully the audio works. And also, I'm not trying to play a song. <laughs> because I'm not musically talented. <laughs> but uh, um, the speaker is actually pretty loud. Um, you can also play, um, like you can load, like I don't remember if it's MP3s or not, but you can load an audio file onto the board itself and then play the song or play the play the tone, but you have to be kind of small in how big the file is, which I thought was pretty cool as well. You can make yourself like a little alarm or something. Um, okay. And so I mentioned before you can like connect other things to the board. Um, and those contacts also make that easy, um, to do. So the cables here are called alligator clips and you can just clip them to the pads cause they're, they're, they're pretty large. So you can kind of just, you don't need to get really small cables to connect to them. And then you can connect like an external circuit to it. Um, in this case, um, the code here is showing um, what would happen if you uh, connected like a potentiometer to it. And um, so a potentiometer is also an AEC device. It's basically a voltage divider. Um, so you can think of it as like a knob. You turn the knob, the voltage goes up, you turn it the other way, it goes down. And that different voltage received by the micro is interpreted and then um, you decide what to do with it. Um, in this case, <clears throat> I did have to do a little bit of conversion here um, because it was externally connected. So I had to convert it from the kind of what we call ADC counts that it got received into a value between zero and a hundred. Um, that's what this conversion is doing here. And so the ADCs are usually a certain size. In this case, it's um, 16 bits. Um, and I kind of normalize it. And then I divide it by 100 so I can set the brightness of these pixels, which is actually between 0 and 1. Um, so you can twist twist potentiometer to dim lights. Um, so I don't think I actually have a video of the dimming lights example here. But instead, I actually attached a joystick that I got here because it's it's more fun than a knob. Um, and I was able to read the x and y value of the joystick. They're basically potentiometers on their own. And then I just did a little equation to determine the brightness of what I wanted the LEDs to be. And based on the brightness, I um, changed what color lights or what color the light should light up as. So that way I could um, just twist the joy 
stick around and the lights will change brightness and color depending on where the position of the joystick is. Um, which I, I thought was pretty cool. I've seen it more complicated with this and you know, use a joystick and maybe create a game. But first step, <laughs> make the lights blink pretty. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to add a picture here. It's fine. Um, so the other really cool thing about the blue fruit one, you can connect it to um, your phone. So the, the phone app I was using, I think there's two that Adafruit has. Um, this one was called blue fruit LED connect and they have documentation on like how to actually use it. Uh, but you basically write code to broadcast um, like, hey, I'm ready, please connect to me. And you open up the app, choose the device and connect. And then once you get in there, there's multiple different options like built into the app. Um, you can, there's like a color picker. So it shows like the RGB color wheel type of thing. And you like go and you can pick your color and it'll tell you what the RGB value is. Um, there's like a, uh, sorry, arrow, like keypad type of thing. There's um, graphing, you could do like graphing, um, like input from that accelerometer. You could like make a graph of the X acceleration or Y acceleration. Um, it's got just a bunch of really cool options. Um, yeah, here, here's some of the, the code to do the um, advertising for the Bluetooth. Um, but basically it kind of walks you through an Adafruit site, like how to actually do all of the startup code. Cause I'm not super familiar with how Bluetooth works. Um, but then you're able to send messages between the board and your phone through Bluetooth, which I think is super cool. Um, one of the serial communication protocols is called UART, and that's Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. And it's just a way to transfer messages between two, between two things. Um, and in this case, you can send from your phone to the board. You can send from the board to your phone. Um, this example is sending it from the, the board to the phone. So it's um, figuring out the X, Y, Z um, acceleration, um, and then just sending it over to your phone, and then it'll you can see it when it receives it here, it prints it um, onto the screen. Um, so that was super cool. Um, what I'm trying to work on now is like figuring out how to make it like a pedometer so that um, you could read the acceleration on the board, figure out how many steps or like when someone takes a step and then being able to show it on the phone. So far, I'm still trying to figure out like how someone takes a step, um, trying to work through that math because it's a little more math intense than I first thought. Um, but that's kind of like a cool possibility of what you could do with it. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, like there's like that library folder that you can put on your um, on the board and then just use drag and drop the library files. Um, CircuitPython's website has um, all the latest files in a bundle. So you just download the bundle and you can pick and choose what you want in case they don't all fit on the board at once. Uh, and then Adafruit, I think recently updated this circ up tool and that helps keep your libraries up to date and it'll check, make sure the latest version. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, be careful if you put too many things on there at once, um, you might run out of memory. But there are just like, tons and tons of libraries of things that so it really saves you a lot of effort you can kind of just get to the fun part of like i want to make this cool thing do this and not so much like startup required um it's just a a dump of um resources like adafruit site is great they're learned at adafruit sorry part of it um circuit pythons read the docs is excellent the linkedin learning class um if you have access to that um, there's also a book, I have not read it, um, but I was trying to find more CircuitPython resources. Um, and the book seemed um, pretty pretty basic, but if you like reading, that's there. Um, it seemed like most of the stuff would be covered on their website anyway. Um, but if you're into like paperback books, they have that available. Um, and then I found this make code um, to adafruit.com and it'll actually have it's just in the browser. And so it'll have like a picture of the board on the side and then you can write your code on the, write, write your code next to it and it'll kind of simulate what you're doing. And there's also like a JavaScript portion of it. I'm not too familiar with what that did, but 
that looks super cool if you just want to like try it out and like not actually buy any hardware yet. Um, let me see. Yep, that was it. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have um, the presentation, all of the code samples, um, and some extra things that I had um, from a previous pres presentation with PyOhio on this repo. Um, there's my email address if you want to contact me. I'll copy it over into the chat when um, when we're when I'm done. Um, but yeah, feel free. Anybody have any questions? I do have to give credit to where I took this slide presentation from to make sure they they get their credit here. But uh, thank you guys for having me. I hope this inspired you to try something in hardware. It's it can be not so scary. I guess is the conclusion. <laughs>